In case you haven't heard, we'll be going through some changes uh, starting the next week or so. Uh, we will be suspending our 8 o'clock worship service and uh, focusing on uh, 9.30 and 11 and 11, 11, that's now at 11 uh, service. Uh, everybody says, why don't you have an 11, 11 service? Well, that's when they showed up. So, <laughs> so we just started when they showed up. <laughs> A lot of things going on, and I uh, want to just kind of catch you up here a little bit. One, um, this, this congregation has sent out over f uh, about 1,500 members to our other campuses and church starts. 1,500. Uh, that's amazing. Uh, that, that, that really is. And, and all of them are doing well. Uh, Station Hill, Nolansville, all of them are doing extremely well. Now, what, here's what that means. For a long time, Brentwood Baptist Church grew linearly. You know what that means? People would drive in from other communities to be part of this congregation. Um, uh, they would drive in from Nolansville. They would drive in sometimes from Columbia. It wasn't unusual to find someone who was driving 30 minutes or so to be part of Brentwood Baptist Church. As we have started these other campuses, they're not driving into this campus. They're stopping at the other campuses, which is what we wanted to happen. Uh, now, if I was a typical Southern Baptist pastor, I would have led you to build a five or 7,000 seat auditorium. That's what we would have done. Uh, and, uh, and we would have been trapped with that thing in a few years of having a building we could not use. We decided to go another way with the vision that God gave us with the Middle Tennessee Initiative. And so now we have lots of outposts, lots of foreign, uh, forward operating bases right where the people are, and is exciting to see what God's doing. Now, what does that mean for this campus, this congregation? Uh, how, a lot of you are in sales, and you had that really big year, right, when, uh, when you broke all the records and, and the company decided, we're paying this guy way too much. Uh, we're paying this lady way too much. So what did they do? They cut your territory. Right? Gave you a smaller territory to force you to go deeper with your customers. Guess what? God has cut our territory. Okay? He said, you don't want, I don't want you reaching out linearly as much. I want you reaching a tighter group. I want you focusing on 37027. Our average travel time to people who attend this campus has shortened from about 30 minutes to about 20 minutes. Okay? Now that means we have the opportunity to go deeper with the folks who are moving into Brentwood. Now, you're saying Brentwood is landlocked. We are. The city of Brentwood is as big as it's ever going to be. Now, here is how Brentwood is growing. Uh, they're having families of four and five buy houses from a retiring couple of two. Uh, a, a couple no longer wants to keep up the one-acre lot. lot. They're moving to a smaller place. They're selling it to somebody who's moving in. And that's how this city is growing. Now, here's what's interesting about those people who are moving in. They're coming from California, Colorado, uh, Chicago, New York, uh, Virginia, uh, even Florida. Did you know that Brentwood has a positive growth from Florida? Do you know that? I guess people get down there and decide it's not all that and come back. <laughs> okay. What else have I just told you? They're coming from places that are not churched. They're coming from places where going to church is not part of their life. They're not moving here looking for a place to go to church. It's not on their conversation. It's not something their family is looking for. They're looking for the parks. They're looking for the schools. They're looking for the safety. All of those things that make Brentwood a great place to live. And they're not thinking about church. For the first time, and I've told you this, for the first time, I had someone ask me what I do. I told them. They asked me where my church was. I told them. And when I told them where it was, they acted surprised. That's what that building is. Okay? The, the cross on top didn't give you a clue? I thought maybe. <clears throat> okay, here's why, here's why they haven't seen this building. Your eyes tell you, your mind tell your eyes what to see. Their mind had not told them to look for a church. Okay, now, professional habit for me, I can't go 15 feet without finding a church. Uh, Jeannie says, can't we just drive without pointing out all the churches? No. 
I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. It's just what I do. Okay? That, that's who our neighbors are now. And now we're going to have to think a lot more like missionaries. How do we begin these conversations? How do we start these conversations? Uh, how do we create a con uh, 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 an atmosphere where these conversations can happen? We're going to think a lot more like missionaries and stop thinking like we're in the buckle of the Bible belt. Okay? A lot more like missionaries and a lot. Now, I know <laughs> the only person that likes change is a wet baby. But the only things that don't change are dead. <coughs> Living things change. It's part of it. And, and, and some people at 8 o'clock say, well, we're just going to grow at 9.30 again. We'll have to start 8 o'clock all over again. And when we do, we'll know how to do it. <laughs> I pray that's the problem Jesus gives us. Every day I pray, give me the problem of too many people. We'll know what to do. And we'll be able to handle that. So uh, that's not the last change. <gasps> Get ready. Uh, and, we'll, and we'll be talking to you about, about some more of those. But wanted to let you know about uh, those that will be happening here uh, pretty quick. I, I grew up in Huntsville, Alabama. And Huntsville, Alabama is, uh, was the, the Marshall Space Flight Center and Redstone Arsenal. So we have lots of science around. And one of the first big science projects we got to do was the exploding volcano. Y'all remember that? Put a little baking soda in there. Uh, baking soda, baking powder, baking soda. And vinegar. And it would gush over. Y'all remember that? It, it was the coolest thing ever. If you just had the baking soda and you just had the vinegar, nothing would work. So they put a little baking soda in this little cone where you built your cool volcano. And then you poured vinegar on the top. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it never gets old, does it? <laughs> it just, for weeks after we learned how to do this, the grocery stores in Huntsville, Alabama were out of vinegar. Uh, all, the, all the little boys went home and said, Mama, Mama, let me do this, let me do this. And since it was science, Mom had to let us do it. And so we were, we were making things blow up all over, uh, all over the town. Uh, you know people, don't you, who just have the baking soda? Good people. A lot of good things going on in their life. Just no fizz. No pop. Right. Missing something. And you know people who just have the vinegar, don't you? But no baking soda. So nothing happens. But what happened when those two things get together? Well, that's what we find out in Acts chapter 10, the story of Cornelius. Stand with me in honor of God's Word. We're going to pick up this story right in the middle of it. Verse 30, so Cornelius replied to Simon Peter, four days ago at this very hour, at three in the afternoon, I was praying in my house, and just then a man in dazzling clothing stood before me and said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard, your acts of charity have been remembered in God's sight. Therefore, send someone to Joppa and invite Simon here, who is also named Peter. He is lodging in Simon Peter, the tanner's house by the sea. So I immediately sent for you, and it was good for you to come. So now we are all in the presence of God to hear everything you've been commanded by the Lord. So here we are all in the presence of God to hear everything that you've been commanded by the Lord. This is God's Word for God's people. Hear it, believe it, and live. Let's pray together. We pray for all of those who are Cornelius. We pray for all of us who are Simon Peter. That what you did then, you will do now. And we pray this in your name. Amen. 
So let's cut right to the chase. Chapter 10 in the book of Acts is one of those chapters that after this chapter, everything is different. Until this time, we have been focusing mainly on the Jewish community, especially the Jewish community in and around Jerusalem. Now the gospel is exploding out of Jerusalem throughout the Roman Empire. Uh, I've told you this before. Luke ends his work, uh, the book of Acts. He ends the book of Acts very clumsily. He ends it with this word, unhinderedly. That's the direct Greek translation, unhinderedly. Uh, it is very, very poor Greek. You, you wouldn't have written it that way. And the interesting thing is Luke is one of the best writers that we have. Technically, he's one of the best writers we have. And he ends it with uh, a faux pas, a, a bad grammar. It, it's one of the things that great writers do to make you pay attention to what they're trying to say. And so he leaves this word hanging out there, this word unhinderedly, for you to understand that the entire book of Acts is about the gospel of Jesus Christ being preached unhinderedly. Every barrier, every wall, every wall that the gospel came up against, the Holy Spirit blows down that wall and the gospel continues to grow and reach other people. Now, the challenge is how do we reach people who are not Jewish? An early controversy was does somebody have to become a Jew before they become a Christian? That's the big controversy in chapter 15. So now we have a man, Cornelius. He is a Gentile. Who is Cornelius? He's a Gentile. He's not Jewish. He is a Roman. Not only is he a Roman, he is a soldier. Not only is he a soldier, he is a commander. So not only does this guy have three strikes, he has four strikes. But there's something else about it. The community says he's a good man. The people around him recognize his charity, his goodness. He takes care of people. He is mindful of people. He takes care of his soldiers. He is a good commander. He's a good citizen. He's a good person. But he doesn't know Jesus Christ. You know people like that, don't you? You know Cornelius. You know Cornelius, he's that friend you have that is actually more Christian than your Christian friends. <laughs> have you got that one? But has never had the encounter with Jesus Christ. So he lacks the vinegar to the baking soda. There's no overflow, there's no pop, there's no, no fizz to the life because of the absence of Jesus Christ and you don't know whether or not to say anything because you think if you share the gospel with your friend you will insult them. True. Right? True. All right, hold on to that. Simon Peter is going on at the same time. Who's Simon Peter? We know who Simon Peter was. He's one of the disciples. He is the loudest of the disciples. He's the strongest of the disciples. He's the one who promised Jesus he would never leave him. He's the one who left. And he's the one that Jesus found on the shore of Galilee and brought back into his full calling as an apostle, as a disciple. And now Peter is the leader of the Jerusalem church. He is leading their outreach efforts. He's the one everybody goes to. He's also a bigot. Now, this is important for a lot of us to, to, to hear right now. You're not born full grown. Okay? We talk about being born again. Being born again implies you will grow again. Amen. Okay? You're not born fully uh, in the likeness of Christ. You were born to grow into that likeness of Christ, which means you're always going to be growing, you're always going to be learning, and you're always going to be being transformed. Amen. Okay? Simon Peter had learned a lot. Simon Peter had been through a lot. Now he had to go through this wall. What wall was that? Thinking that nobody outside of, of the Jewish community could be saved. Now, the early promise was that the Messiah would come through the Jews and the Messiah would come to the Jews. They took that to understand that the Messiah would come only to the Jews. And now the Holy Spirit is breaking down that wall. Now, he did that through a series of dreams that Simon Peter had. 
uh, all of this food is presented to, uh, to Simon Peter. He's commanded to get up and eat. The food is not kosher. Doesn't, doesn't fit Jewish law. So he says, can't do it. Not going to do it. Jesus says, what I've created don't you dare call common. Now, we're going to find out in a little bit that Simon Peter's dream had nothing to do with food. Right. Okay? But Jesus talked to Simon Peter in a way he could understand. This is one of the reasons I think Simon Peter was a Baptist, because his love language was food. <laughs> I want to talk to you, Simon Peter, in a way that you can understand. Let's talk about what you eat. In the middle of that dream, there's a knock on the door. On the knock on the door, there are a couple of servants, and there is a soldier. You're being summoned by our commander. Uh-oh. I wonder what Simon Peter was thinking as he walked over to the house of Cornelius. I can guarantee you this, he was not ready for what he found. He walks in, asks why he's there. Cornelius says, I have been praying. And Jesus told me to come find you. Simon must have thought, hmm, I was praying and I was praying about food. <laughs> ah, I'm getting it. It wasn't about food. That common thing that what I've created isn't common, that wasn't about food at all. Amen. It was about people. Amen. So Peter begins to preach. Right in the middle of the sermon, Cornelius and everybody in the house get saved. They don't wait for the invitation. They don't wait for a call to faith. Right in the middle of it, they get saved to the point that Peter stops preaching, goes over and talks to his friends, said, well, it looks like Jesus has saved these people. I, I guess we got to baptize them. <laughs> I tell you all the time, nothing messes up the church any more than when Jesus starts saving the wrong people. <laughs> now what are you going to do? Let's not overlook something that a lot of us run past. Everybody in this story is praying. Cornelius is praying. Now, Cornelius doesn't understand his prayers. He doesn't understand how he's praying. He doesn't understand really why he's praying. He knows there is something besides himself. There is someone greater than him. He, we don't understand his faith journey to this point. We know this. In his own way, he was begging that God would show him what he needed to know next. The Spirit was working in Cornelius' life before Simon Peter ever got there. Now, this is critical for you to understand as we talk about gospel conversations and we talk about you being ready to share the gospel and you being, having something to say and being prepared in that moment. Understand, when you are given the invitation by the Spirit to share your story, when you are invited by the Spirit to step into this process, the Spirit has been working long before you got there. Amen. Working in this person's life so they'll be prepared to hear the testimony you bring. So when you have that invitation and you don't say anything, you're disobedient, you're scared, whatever, you miss the moment that the Spirit has prepared in this person's life. What if Simon doesn't preach? Cornelius is ready to hear. What if Simon doesn't preach? Then Cornelius doesn't hear. Understand, not only is Jesus working in you, He's working in the other person to prepare just the right moment when what you will say will be just the right thing that they need to hear. So when you have that and that invitation, that nudge from the Spirit, do it with confidence knowing that Jesus is already working in that person's life. Now, Simon Peter, if you're praying, understand that what you are banging up against in your prayer life is where Jesus is going to give you an opportunity to see it. Remember, in college you had lecture and you had lab. You would go to chemistry class and they would say, whatever you do, don't mix these two chemicals together, they will blow up. Then you go to lab, 
and you mix those chemicals together to see how they blow up. <laughs> right? All right? You are told about it, then you experience it. Okay? In life, following Christ, same way. You will find yourself drawn to certain stories in the Bible. You will find yourself engaging certain passages. You will find yourself dealing with a certain issue. And you will get deeper and deeper in that issue. You will say, ah, I think I understand. In that moment, you will have an opportunity to live it. You will hear the truth, then you will learn the truth in your living. Okay, Simon and Peter, pay attention. What I have created, don't you dare call common. You understand that? Yes, sir, I think so. Now, this is Cornelius. I created him. Don't you dare call him common. Amen. What he heard, what he did. So, how are you praying? Who are you praying for? What is the Lord teaching you in your prayer life, in your scripture study, that he will show you in your obedience? We all know people like Cornelius. Amen. Good people. Gracious people. Generous people. Who lack one thing. We all know people like Simon who think, yes, Jesus can do everything but that. We all have a limitation, don't we? Yes, I believe Jesus can do anything, but I won't, uh, he won't do that. He won't save that person. He won't reach that people. The gospel isn't for people like that. And he'll push that wall down. Don't, don't you understand that when you start drawing up a list of people who can't hear the gospel, sooner or later you cross yourself out? Now this is a story about two people praying. This is about a, a story. This is a story about a spirit of God that works in and through everybody to make that moment right so when you share the gospel, the person is ready to hear. Amen. Amen. So who is your Cornelius, Simon? And when that person tells you that they're ready to hear, Will you have anything to say? Let's pray together. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, you know who Cornelius is in your life, don't you? You know who that person is. Pray for them now. Pray somehow in this next week, in these next moments. The Lord will trust you in that moment to say something about who you know he is in your life. Or maybe you're Simon, and maybe you know who Cornelius is, but for whatever reason you're scared to say something, don't want to say something. Don't think it'll happen. Don't think your word will matter. So you pray for courage. You pray for sensitivity to how the, the Lord will lead even in this moment. If you're here and you're like Cornelius and you know you've got a lot of good things in your life, but one thing is missing, don't leave with that one thing still missing. Our friends are already at the table. It says next steps. They're waiting there for you to continue this conversation to help you understand who Jesus is and what he's done and what he can do for you now. Don't leave still lacking that one thing. For others of you, it's as simple as come be part of this church family. You come. Whatever the Lord is calling you to do, he's waiting for you where you are. The church will wait for you as you come. Lord Jesus, every life is now open, every heart. So we pray now the choices we make are exactly what you want.